Welcome to My Therapist Says, an interactive experience enriching your most important relationships. Today's broadcast, I'll be your host and moderator as we present How to Tame the Worry Wart in You and Your Kids. Do you worry about your child? Perhaps uh, you're concerned with your child's friendships or grades or spiritual life and much more. Today, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Burt, who is our ch guest child psychologist, colleague, and friend. She specializes in anxiety and is one of the few psychologists in the San Diego area qualified to offer CogMed working memory training and evidence-based intervention for attention and focusing difficulties. Dr. Burt also offers ADHD evaluations that may be useful for school-related accommodations. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from UCSD, a master's in marriage, Family and Child Counseling from the University of Laverne, and her doctorate in psychology from Southern California Seminary. Dr. Burt will help us all better manage the worry and fear that parents and children experience. Today's event takes place before a live audience and live streaming while offering practical biblical solutions. It's like having your own Christian doctor within the comforts of your living room. I hope you will sit back, relax, and take in these life-changing insights. Please join me as we connect with a live audience and My Therapist Says. Welcome again to My Therapist Says, and again, we're so glad that you're here. And Dr. Burt, thank you for joining us this evening. So glad to have Dr. Burt with us. And without any further introduction, I would like to welcome Dr. Burt. Would you join me in wel welcoming Dr. Barbara Burt, our clinical psychologist? Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Don. Can you push? There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, I'm so happy to be able to talk with you tonight uh, about this topic, um, taming the worry wart. So how many of you might consider yourselves worry warts at times, right? This is the person who <laughs> worries about things, right? And... Uh, so I wanted to um, bring up a couple of examples. Do any of these kinds of things sound familiar? Susan worries that she's going to disappoint her dad because her grades aren't good enough. And her dad worries that maybe his boss won't understand that he needs to get off of work early for a parent-teacher conference. Um, maybe Roger worries that he's going to get bossed around and pushed around at school. And is he going to get embarrassed? Is he going to get hurt? You know, his mom worries, hey, Roger's getting into fights, and maybe he's lying to me, and I don't know what to do about it. Maybe I'm not a good mother. So worry is what happens when we think something bad might happen, might happen to us. Um, now, a lot of these things are real problems, right? If a kid is not doing well in school and not getting grades that they need to get, or that maybe there's a problem that needs to be solved. But our problem-solving part of our brain is not the same part of our brain that worries. So tonight, one of the things I'm going to look at is how can we solve problems without having that worry nag at us? And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So um, it's okay to have problems because we are going to solve them, right? So I want to say meet the worry wart. Um, worry wart is that name that I might use with kids or with, with adults. You know, these principles are the same for kids and adults. And so sometimes, even as an adult, I resonate more to the terms that the kids use because they're very simple and easy to understand. So the worry ward is that name of the part of us that worries. There's actually a part of the brain that gets activated when we feel worried. Um, and the, I would say to a child, you know, the worry ward act, you know, activates your brain, gets your brain going. And it's that your brain sends signals to your body and those signals are so that you're ready to act. And so uh, we can, when I talk to adults and 
people I can give more complex things. It's the amygdala is the part of the brain that's activated uh, when we have worries. But we have this biochemical reaction that happens. And so some of the things that happen when that part of our nervous system gets activated is that we start pumping adrenaline. Um, if you've ever driven down the road and had an animal run out in front of your car and you've slammed on the brakes and then afterwards you're kind of like shaky, right? That's the adrenaline that's gone into your system. So you might tremble or shake. Um, we pump extra blood, our heart races, our breathing. Um, we start breathing fast. Uh, and sometimes as we breathe fast, our muscles tighten up and so our chest tightens and we're breathing real fast. Our body shuts off our digestion. Our body's ready to act and says, you don't need to be digesting food right now. So, um, so a lot of times this worry is accompanied by tummy aches. Kids will sometimes say, I have a tummy ache and they won't identify that they're scared or upset. Um, we might start sweating. Um, and when our worry is activated, we have a hard time thinking. And we might have a hard time remembering. So a child who is anxious at school may have trouble taking in the information from their teachers and remembering it uh, because the anxiety chemicals are blocking um, concentration and memory. So um, a lot of those things are things we don't like. We don't like feeling that way. Uh, so I think one of the things that um, I try to tell people and we talk about is these are signals that are important signals and they're uncomfortable, but the signals themselves do not hurt us. So the fact that our heart is racing doesn't mean we're having a heart attack. Um, the fact that we might be breathing fast doesn't mean something bad is going to happen, right? These are just body signals. So we can have these same signals when a lot of other things happen. Now people spend money to go to amusement parks, right? And they ride a roller coaster and <laughs> their heart pounds fast and, uh, and, and they might go out running um, because they like to jog and they like to go on marathons and their their heart speeds up, their breathing speeds up. They have a lot of these same things. You might go to a scary movie and uh, you have a lot of these same reactions and we choose to do those things. We want to do those things. So our bodies can react to this way even when there's not a problem and we know there's not a problem but our bodies are still reacting. Um, so, and sometimes we can even have these reactions and we don't know why. It's like, I'm not really afraid of anything. I'm not really thinking about anything that's bothering me. But now my heart is starting to speed up and it's scaring me. Um, so we want to remind ourselves and our kids that this is not gonna permanently damage us. You know, this is, this is a body reaction and uh, we might be uncomfortable, but we're gonna be okay. So that's the first thing that I, I want to talk about when worry wart is kind of taking over, that um, we get these reactions. And um, I might say to somebody, your worry wart can be small or your worry wart can be big. And you want to know, how can I get rid of worry wart? Mm -hmm. I don't want him. I don't like this. It doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, you don't get rid of him. In fact, you don't even want to because worrying is really designed by God. That reaction is designed by God. But we want to be able to use it properly. So I will say worrying can help you, right? So we want to tame the worry wart. We don't want the worry wart to be out of control and taking over our lives and our thinking and our taking the joy out of our life but we want to be able to use what God has given in terms of what anxiety and worry is all about. So um, why do we have worry wart? What good is worry wart? 
So we're supposed to worry about things. Um, you might be surprised to hear me say that. The worry wart's job is to protect us. It's designed to be the alarm bell. So, for example, if we smell smoke, we wonder, is there a fire? And so if there is a fire, we need to take some action, right? So the alarm bell goes off, and we need to say, is this a real threat or is it not? If it's really a fire, then it's a problem to solve, right? That's a problem that we need to solve, right? We can't just leave it alone. And so by having that alarm, we can protect, take the action to protect ourselves. Um, but if it's not, like how many times has your smoke detector gone off at home <laughs> when there wasn't a real danger, um, we just have to turn it off. Right? So we got the alarm, we checked, nope, not a real danger, let's turn that off, and we go on. So when the worry ward is wild, he just keeps giving us alarms all the time. And that's the person who is, has anxiety and worry all the time. Every little thing is, it seems like something bad is going to happen. And their life has a lot of fear. Um, but when we tame the worry wart, we can use it to help us keep safe and be protected. So I know that as parents and grandparents and being around kids, one of the things that happens when kids are afraid, a lot of times they're not afraid of something that's real. And the first thing we want to say to them is, you don't have to be afraid. And we do want to reassure them, but we want to maybe give them a chance to say, you know, let's see, is it, what's the chances that that's really going to happen, right? Or what's really happening right now? Are, is there something going on right now? Because right now I'm sitting with you and we're safe. So we give them a chance to check it out and see, is it really something that they need to take action on? So we don't want kids to be ignoring, um, or adults for that matter, ignoring things that they should be worried about. You know, if I'm walking along in the street and I see somebody coming up to me and they look threatening, I don't want to just pretend that's not happening so that I don't have to worry about things. I need to be able to realistically assess the situation. So we, ha we use our worry ward. So we have a worry ward alarm, I would call it. Um, so what do we do when we feel the worry ward alarm? You know, we check to see if there really is a danger right now. And if we do, we need to act. And if there's not, then we have to turn off the alarm. So sometimes people and adults will be worried about things in the future. A lot of times worry is related to the future. It's not really related to what's happening now. Like what if this happens or what if that happens? And those what if questions need to be handled by a different part of the brain, not the worry wart part. They need to be be handled by the thinking part of the brain. So what if, okay, what's the chances that's going to happen? What do I need? Is there anything I can do right now to plan for that? Okay, right now we have a wildfire alert right in San Diego County. So hopefully we've planned in advance because we thought, what if there's a wildfire? We want to be sure that the property's cleared. So we've taken action. We've planned for it. We didn't sit around and worry about it. We said, let's plan. So that's the thinking part, the what if. But if the what if gets taken over by worry wart, you know, there could be a what if of a million things that we can't really plan for. So um, we want to keep the what ifs in our thinking, not in our emotion. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, um, so how do we tame this worry wart? <laughs> After all of that, right? We all know we have, everybody's got worries at times. And um, so I would say we've got four ways to do it. Our, our 
ourselves are marvelously built. Um, we have body, we have a mind, we have connection with others, and of course we have a spirit, spiritual part, right? So those are the things that we can use to help tame the worry wart, to change. So I have four, four little steps for taming the worry wart we'll talk about here. So first is related to changing our bodies. Um, so I would say uh, the first one is to relax and I would say cool it. Remember that phrase that was used to be used a lot more when I was younger, right? <laughs> um, but cool it, that is we want to cool down, right? When we feel, we call it uptight, right? Physically uptight, we have a, a heat, an energy. And we want to make that cooler. We want to breathe slowly and deeply. Our breath is an amazing way to uh, allow our body to go out of the autonomic nervous system that's all um, revved up when we have worries and anxiety and um, to move into the other part of our nervous system and in the parasympathetic part that is activated partly by breath um, that we will we can't have all those other reactions at the same time so our hearts beating fast we breathe we relax we slow it down our breathing we slow it down um, I like to say you know do a freeze frame where everything becomes slow action and you get calmer um, and even using, our minds are so powerful if you use imagery in your mind. Um, imagine the stillest lake and let your body become still like that lake. So um, I, I put on the slide, if you pick up a handout, you can see, you know, you take, taking breaths, taking a big, long, slow breath, um, breathe in and I would say about four counts, and then breathe out. Try to breathe out for double the amount of time that you breathe in. And I can guarantee you that if you breathe out, you will breathe in again. <laughs> so people are like, don't worry. You just breathe it all out. And each time you, you know, focus on the exhale, and when you're breathing out, you can let go of a little bit of the tension that your body's holding. So that's the first thing, you're intervening in your body. And there's other things that you can do, but that's, that's probably the, one of the main ones, really, is to, to focus on breath. Um, so relax is number one. So number two, easier said than done, but, but think about breathing. But I needed my alliteration of R words, so relax and cool it. Number two is remember. So remember I said earlier that uh, we have to remind ourselves um, that this is physical reaction is not going to permanently damage us. It's not going to hurt us. So you might say something like this. These, these signals may be uncomfortable, but they don't hurt me. And I, I can make some, decide what to do. Maybe I'm going to breathe. And they're going to go away. They're going to go away eventually. You know? And I can make it until they go away. Um, one of the people I knew had said, he used to say to himself, these are just chemicals in my body. I'll, you know, I can handle that until they go away. Um, and the relaxed breathing will start reversing those uncomfortable body signals most of the time. So you're going to start... Re reversing those with, with breath and with calm thinking and with calm imagery, and your body starts responding to that. And so just remember that you're not going to, you, you don't need to panic, that nothing terrible is going to happen while you're having these signals in your body. They're just an alarm bell that you have to turn off. So you've already checked, of course, to see that there's not a problem to solve immediately, <laughs> but, you know, assuming that there's not. So... We have relax and cool it, start that breath, start the calmness, remembering that you're basically already safe. You just feel upset. And number three is 
changing, starting also in changing our mind. We're going to review, and I would say review the evidence. What is the evidence that there's a danger right now? Um, and if there's not, or not. So, um, and this is where you get that what if thinking. Well, mo you know, a lot of times people will be thinking, well, there's not a danger right now, but what if? It's like, well, if you start noticing what if, change it to what is. Focus on what is happening right now. You don't need to think about what might happen in the future or what might happen even five minutes from now because you don't have any control over that. You have control over what's happening right now. And so if there's no danger right now and there's nothing that you need to do right now to prepare, then um, you want to move from what is to what is happening, what if to what is happening. So sometimes it's just a matter of like, let me come back and be fully present in this moment. Let me notice that this is a nice hard arm, and, but the material is soft. Uh, let me put my feet well grounded on the floor. I'm really present in this room and look at people and look around and look at the colors in the room. Find, use your senses. Find five different colors so that you're really connecting. Oh, there's, that's a beautiful blue. That's, uh, that's a white and a gray and red. Um, what smells do you smell? What sounds do you hear? Become really present. Sometimes people call this mindfulness. Um, but it's, it's, you know, as, as they say, God's given us a gift, and it's called the present, mm -hmm. right? The present moment that we have. So, um, and the other thing I would say about review, so we're reviewing the evidence, we're coming into the present, and the third thing along this line is, if your brain is continuing to give you scary images or fearful thoughts, um, I encourage the kids that I work with to imagine that they have a remote control like most of us have remote controls for our TV now, um, that they have a remote control for their brain. So their brain is giving them a picture of something scary. Let's change the remote control to another channel. And I even do this with adults too. Let's pick out the channel in advance before you have a scary thought or a, a bad day. Just pick out your channel right now. So one of my channels is the beach, to watch the waves coming in and crashing on the beach. Um, I call it actually sometimes the screensaver of my mind, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> let's just go, go there and let it play over and over, just the waves coming into the beach. Um, you can pick, we can make our own imaginary place, or maybe it's a real place that we've been where we have calmness and peace and we can change the channel of our brain to run that movie in our head instead of whatever we have been thinking about. So, um, so whether it's um, changing the words we're saying to ourselves or we're changing the picture. So if words are what's coming into your brain and bothering you, then change the words. If it's picture that's coming into your brain, then change the picture, but we're going to change that channel. Um, so it, all of these things are really most easy to use when we've practiced them, right? So if you know that you have worries at times, the time to try these things are not when you're worried. I mean, yes, try them if you're worried if you need, and you need to do something, but it'll be much more effective if you practice doing the breathing when you're not worried and up, uptight when you practice doing changing the channel, when you're not uh, experiencing distress. Because then it's so much more natural when you try it under a little bit of stress. So first of all, we, um, we wanted to relax. We wanted to remember that we were basically safe right now. Um, we wanted to review. And then the last thing 
is to reflect. And this is connecting with others and engaging our spirit. Um, these, some of these scriptures will be very familiar to many of you, but of course, from First Peter, you know, cast your care, care is the way I learned it, cast your care on him because he cares for you. Or in the, new, in the NIV, it's cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So we need to remember who's in charge, right? And so to reflect on that, um, I might use a, something like this. You know, I'm loved by God and others. So there's probably people in your support system that love you. Um, that's sometimes why we'll challenge people when they don't feel that. You know, it's like, really? Let's talk about who, who really would want to help you. Other people might be there for you. But um, God is always there for us, and he promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. Mm -hmm. So even though we're feeling distressed, this is where we do activate our faith and our mind because our bodies can be giving us these signals, but our mind knows that we are safe in him, right? And we can remember that. So reflecting um, can help and can help get through that distressing time. So these are the things that we can do to tame that worry wart so that we can activate the benefit of the alarm, but not have the alarm or the worry wart run our lives. Um, and that we can tame it so that we can be more happy and fulfilled. That's that's basically what I wanted to share tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Burke, what a wonderful, wonderful start for us this evening. What I love about My Therapist Says is that we have a specialist, and really what Dr. Burt said is just absolutely spot on, and I so appreciate, very practical, how we can put our arms around it and actually respond with our bodies. It's very similar techniques that I use also as a therapist, so I deeply appreciate hearing your insight and perhaps a new take on these concepts. We want to just dive into some of the questions this evening and keeping in mind that you're helping us. I was taking notes. I'm always learning. Isn't it great to be a learner? Um, actually, curious people are healthy people because we're, we're meant to do the very last thing you said, and that is to reflect. You know, reflection is the ability to kind of think about what's happening and shall I make a choice? Shall I choose another path or asking, of course, the Lord in this? So I so appreciative that you ended with that and concluded with that, that concept of reflection. But we have number one is to, to learn how to relax. Uh, number two is to remember. Uh, and then number three, to review the evidence. And then number four, uh, to reflect. These are very, very helpful. It's quite amazing, the whole concept of breathing. If we could start there for just a moment. I do have one question. If you have a question, please place it on your three by five card and just hold it in the air and we'll try to respond to it. I do have a question that we'll start with in just a moment. Why is breathing, I'd like to start with that because I, I completely agree that breathing is so amazingly important. You know, God breathed life into us. That's how we really come to be, have come to be in the Old Testament. It tells, that, tells us very clearly. Why again is breathing so important? Uh, because I've seen people that when they become a bit anxious, they stop breathing from their lower abdominal area and then into their chest. They change from that breathing like a little baby that it's on its back and you see the little tummy rise. And they're very relaxed and all you see is the tummy rise. So they're breathing very naturally and they're breathing very deeply. And you talked about how when we become a little anxious, uh, we can begin to chest breathe here. That's why some people, their, their, their um, chest or near their esophagus, their, their neck will become rather red and... There's a lot of tension there, and many of us have had that happen when we've sp spoken in front of a large audience, perhaps, I'm not saying you, Dr. Burt, but with that, why is this breathing so important? I just want to stop there for just a moment because it's so important. All the research is showing that. The more we know about the brain is saying that breathing is so important. You were helping us to see that it moves us from the uh, autonomic or this automatic reaction Two, that we can slow it down with our parasympathetic system, which helps us to go to a more relaxed, deep breathing that you talked about. So could you just help us a little more on the importance of breathing that you've seen as a clinician 
with your clients? Because it sounds as though you spend time working on that, as I do. Absolutely. Yes. Well, I think there's a lot of biomedical reason in where the breath, the oxygen, when the oxygen comes into our system, it starts changing our cells and our chemical reactions. Uh, but I think particularly um, with breathing, a lot of times people feel that it's almost too simple of an answer. Yes. And that, well, I, I can't. I, can't, I mean, I, 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 my breath is, like you were saying, it was tight. Yes. So I try to remind people, and, uh, for example, think about um, a new balloon that's never been blown up before. And you've just taken it out of the package and you try to blow it up. It's pretty hard to blow up, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yes. but if you get a little bit of air in it, and then you let it out, and then you blow it again, the second time you blow it, it blows up a little more and a little easier, mm -hmm. and you let that out, and the third time a little more, and it blows up a little more and a little easier, mm -hmm. and our lungs are like that too, because when we start having the reaction, and our one of the reactions, our muscles tighten, including our chest muscles, which compress our lungs down, and, um, and we're breathing more shallow, shallowly. And the, so people was like, I can't take a deep breath. And it's like, mm -hmm. don't worry, just take as much in as you can, mm -hmm. um, and then let it out like that balloon, and then take it again. And each time you breathe, try to breathe a little slower and a little deeper. And just when you let it out, try to notice that a little bit of tension goes out of your body. And, and just keep doing it. Um, most people want to stop too quickly. Oh, this isn't working. I'm, you know, I can't get a breath. You have to be patient with it and patient with yourself because you will be able to breathe if you just keep going at it it's kind of slowly and, and not worrying that you're not getting as much breath as you want to have. Um, I have some sinusy things that happen sometimes and I can't breathe through my nose. And I remember when I was first like taught to breathe, to relax, it was like, okay, breathe through your nose and out through your mouth. It's like, that's great advice, except I can't breathe through my nose. <laughs> so can you just breathe however you can breathe, right? <laughs> just breathe. Um, but they'll often say, breathe through your nose and out through your mouth. They're like, okay, but I'm not your poster child for that one. But, um, <laughs> but it, breathe however you can breathe. <laughs> That's a good way, because a lot of times people say, do you want me through my nose or through my mouth? And there's research on both sides of that. Why don't we try that for a moment? Could you lead us through that? Because we do want the abdominal sure. area, we want almost the diaphragm to drop, and so the tummy to come out first to take a deep breath, and then you take the almost the second breath, it's still the same breath, in the upper chest, and then again, you had suggested, which research shows, to breathe twice as long out. You'll notice that if we're sitting up, if you might sit up, those of you who are listening live stream, is just sit up and hold your hand right in your tummy, your stomach area, and you want your tummy to come out first, correct? It's sort of those of you who have been trained vocally. You, you learn this in vocal lessons. They'll teach you that as one of the first ways to deep breathe. You've, you've perhaps heard an opera singer who has this long <laughs> exhale of, of, of singing. Typically, they've taken a very strong breath because their diaphragm is flattened, which means right into the tummy that it's flattened. So your tummy comes out for the first breath, and then the, the second breath, I'll just illustrate that I've a man. Would you lead us? But it would be here like I would with my stomach. It would go. And notice as I breathe out that actually my shoulders relaxed a bit naturally where we hold a lot of tension. Did you notice my cranium, my head began to lean forward? because my shoulders were, were relaxing. Of course, I had a lot of breath that was going out, out of my uh, uh, lungs, of course, but it starts to begin to relax the body. Am I correct? Okay. Absolutely. Why don't so you want to try it again. I know. You were a great model. We have oh. to watch Don and all. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know I said, would you lead us, and then I kind of did That's it first, okay. but yes. Yeah. Could Let's we try that? It. I think it's very okay. helpful to try it yourself, experience it. Some people never breathe well. 
they, they've only chest breathed mm -hmm. in their life, except for when they were a baby and very relaxed, of course. Yeah, and, and I encourage you, if you're, if you're trying this, to put your hand on your lower stomach so that in your abdomen area so you can feel it. Mm -hmm. You want to feel it, as Dawn mentioned, moving out. Then you know you're, you're uh, breathing very deeply. So I'm going to count. It's hard for me to count and breathe at the same okay, time. So, so I will count and, I'll breathe. and you'll breathe. Okay. okay? <laughs> so, okay, so take a breath in. Two, three, four, and then out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Very good. Now that might have been too long. So if you can yeah, I almost fainted, but I was, I'm okay, I think. I'm <laughs> sitting down, so I'm doing okay. <laughs> you can't. So some people like to count um, when they do it because mm -hmm. uh, it helps give them the, uh, you know, a pacing for themselves. Other people don't. I, I personally don't like to count because then I'm all in my head about the numbers. But mm -hmm. I'll just breathe in as long as I can and then breathe out approximately twice as long. <laughs> so... Yeah. Um, so, and if you are a little, if you can't breathe in for a total count of four, either you have to count real fast or <laughs> you have to just <laughs> breathe in as much as you can and then let it go. But uh, I'll do it without the counting this time. So try it again, okay. um, but just breathe in and out. Good job, Don. Thank you, my good student. Give me my, here. Good. my because sample anytime. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Burt. What, one of the reasons when people become anxious, guess what we tend to do? <gasps> Maybe not that dramatic. I'm a little dramatic up here, but that we tend to chest breathe up high, and that begins to tighten our entire body, particularly around the vocal cords. That's why if somebody's a little bit anxious, their voice goes up a little bit because it's tightening. Have you ever noticed early in the morning when you're relaxed, you have this deep voice, at least mine's deep in the morning, it kind of gets higher during the day, but, but you're, typically you're very relaxed, your body's relaxed if you've had a good night's sleep. So part of it is helping to relax. The other thing it can be used for is an intervention. So if I'm worried about something, I know you used First Peter, I think, as a great example, you know, cast your cares, excuse me, cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you that it can be used as an intervention so that we stop thinking about something that's kind of ruminating like the little hamster on the, on the wheel. It's running fast, 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 but not going anywhere, and it seems to cycle for you. It can be used as an intervention to actually stop that thought to give you the opportunity to do a bit of reflection. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. okay this, this question is, and we may have other questions. We certainly do. And the first question we have this evening, again, this is why my therapist says I really believe is so useful, is because we are responding to real life questions. We're not creating the questions. These are real life questions you have. You've come to this event. Some are listening, live stream, and others by our archived DVDs. It says this, uh, Dr. Bird, I'll admit, this person says, I'll admit that I, I worry about finances. And that's probably an area where people can worry. I worry about finances, particularly when hit with expenses that are unexpected. And that can be maybe I'm expecting these to happen because I've had a lot of unexpected surprises. So, for example, today, I guess this was an event today. Someone said $590 uh, for a car that we can't afford to repair, even though there's still $1,000 left to repair the vehicle. We have no emergency fund because we still have a daughter in college. I know we're told to be anxious for nothing, as the Bible says, but that's sometimes easier said than done. Knowing the bill needs to be paid, even though we've been economizing, makes me nervous, a God-given emotion, what to do. And I know we've talked quite a bit about this, but what a great question. I think most of us could relate to that question, maybe not just finances, but other situations, because anxiety is anticipating, and you had talked about it earlier that oftentimes we tend to anticipate or think that there might be something in the future. So am I correct in the DSM? We know the diagnostic manual from which we work, that anxiety is anticipatory. I'm anticipating something's going to happen. How would you respond to this? Well, there's no doubt that 
when you don't have money to pay for something that you're, you're thinking, what am I going to do, mm -hmm. right? So the what am I going to do question is designed for your thinking mm -hmm. to process. Um, the worrying part is the emotional upset that goes with that, okay? So the emotional upset part is on that is uh, some disaster is going to befall me mm -hmm. because I can't pay this bill or because we aren't going to have this car. You might not even think of it as, quote, a disaster, but that's the emotional reaction, like something, this isn't bad. And I would say question yourself about that. What's the evidence that if you don't pay this bill, that some disaster is going to f befall you? In, in me, you may have an inconvenience. You may have uh, difficulties with respect to, you know, maybe transportation is another problem you'll have to solve. But really, is, you know, your life on the line? Are you, is, or is a loved one going to be hurt? It's mostly maybe changing our perspective that this is a difficulty and it's a problem to solve and we don't like it, but, but it's moving it into problem solving mm -hmm. and then doing some other things to deal with the emotion that it's a disaster. So you might have to change your thinking, you might have to change your body or call upon some support of like this is you know just a friend where you can say hey this is just really hard for me right now and you know um, sometimes that's enough to give you some emotional support just like I, I know I can deal with this in the long run but right now it's just really difficult um, mm -hmm. and to and of course God and God yes and the, the moving into problem solving this is what oftentimes I'll see and I don't know if anyone has experienced it this way that this example of the finances, it could be there's a lot going on in this family's life, uh, a daughter in, or a child in college, it looks like, a daughter in college. I have a daughter in college, too, so I thought I was putting that in there. And there is stress about a daughter being in college these days, <laughs> or a son for that matter, that the pr moving into problem solving can be difficult. Dr. Burt talked about this, and I'd like to bring this out at this point. So let's say for this, this particular family situation, what can happen is there's still money left, so you would think that, that we'd be okay. What, what can happen is a scenario like this can come up and that my body has observed something like this happening in the past. Maybe I was a child and my parents didn't have enough money. And then we went through a very difficult time and we didn't have enough food. And so my body gets regressed, we call it. My body gets triggered back to that moment, so this, this scenario is right now, right in the present, and Dr. Burt was inviting us to be present right now. However, my body can tell me, danger, 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 this is going to be a disaster, so now I'm very anxious and I'm anticipating the worst. We call it catastrophizing. I'm going to the worst place. Has anyone ever had that happen? Okay, that's a pretty common experience, isn't it? So in that situation, you've helped us with all of these tools. Let's say in this situation, if we could just laser focus on trying to move this particular person from feeling perhaps catastrophic about it, moving the bodily response so it's more into the problem-solving area where the person can then tell his or her body it's going to be okay and we need to relax a bit and settle down. Yeah, I think... Again, it is a lot easier said than done, yes. but, I, but it is that process of basically taming the, the bodily reaction, hmm. um, remembering that you aren't really in danger right this second, so that you can remind yourself that, so you can move into thinking, because as I talked about earlier, when you have these reactions, it interferes with thinking, it interferes with problem solving. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it can be so important to be able to to get the emotional reaction and the physical the physical slash emotional reaction go together, right? Uh, under control. So it might be used as an intervention. So if you find yourself reacting a lot, you're very reactionary about something and this is a scenario. 
it could be that you would practice, like Dr. Burt, you were suggesting, practice on your own, breathing well, and positively thinking. This is not new age that we're talking about here this evening. It's really proven mental health hygiene is what we're suggesting. You could take a break from, say, a discussion and breathe well. Uh, you talked about the, the idea of um, to relax, find ways to relax, you know, change your body, relax it. You also said to remember, um, I can make it until it goes away, I think is what you said. Use it as alarm belt to turn off. Um, and, and I think, too, we, um, you may, uh, another thing that can be helpful for people, if you're in a reaction mode, mm -hmm. remember someone that you know who is calm under pressure. Mm. And uh, these are great models. You know, there's certain people that just seem to, are able to do that more in their lives. I, I can admire them. Mm -hmm. But if you know somebody like that, think to yourself, you know, if, like, if I was thinking of Susan, okay, I would say, you know, I know Susan, if, if, if Susan were having this, how would she react? Because if you vividly imagine that, you can start feeling it. You know, mm -hmm. channel your inner Susan, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I react more calmly. And that will allow your thinking brain to come back in control. One of the things that does happen um, that we know from the science is that the, the amygdala, the worry wart part of the brain, gets triggered faster than the thinking part. So it gets the advantage. <laughs> it, get, it gets right in there. So you got to tame it so that you have your thinking part can um, kind of come online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that when you slow, your body slows down, you have more of management of, of uh, your bodily response, your reaction, that your amygdala will not be, we call it hijacked, you know, will not be causing that reactivity. You'll be able to be aware of when you begin to feel a little uncomfortable. Uh, we, when we're teaching, I know both uh, Dr. Bird and I do most of the supervision of both students and interns. Those are those who have completed their degree and are moving toward licensure. So we have quite a few students and interns each week that each of us separately uh, work with. And helping those, those people be aware of their own reactivity when they're in a session with someone is a vital part of a good therapist developing her or his skill as a therapist is to be aware, like I'm listening to someone, somehow my, my throat is tightening a little bit. I'm wondering why it's tightening. Maybe I'm uncomfortable with what, what is being said. And that helps one to be present, which is what you talked about. The beauty of the scriptures, when you think about it, is Jesus was really helping us to see that God is always present with us. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest gifts in life is when we have another person, especially the Lord, of course, present with us. One of the worst experiences in life is being abandoned. Both in mental health and the Bible talk very specifically about that, how significant that is. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I think when I think about Jesus, I think about this is, he was able to be completely present yes. with whoever he was with. Yes. Completely himself. Mm -hmm. He never changed who he was to cater to anyone, and yet he could connect with anyone. And he was able to be completely with them. And, um, and, how powerful that is. So. Yeah, because just another note on then I'll get to the next question. When we're completely present with someone, do you have someone like that in your life? I know my wife, Robin, is this way. Is if you have someone in your life that's completely present, we're, not, we're talking about the Lord who is always present with us and demonstrates it constantly, always. When someone's present, it actually lowers our blood pressure mm -hmm. and we calm down because they're just listening to what we're saying without reactivity. However, if I become reactive, like if I were reactive to what you're saying, it could be that, Dr. Burt, you might begin to feel uncomfortable and you're not sure where the conversation's going. If, if someone's fully present, like you're saying, with the other person, really listening without reactivity, both people will tend to calm and become very, very uh, at peace. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that, Please. especially for parents and grandparents. If you have children that, are, that get upset, 
many of you may have already learned this, but um, by reacting very calmly, mm -hmm. um, you can de-escalate them oftentimes. And I'm thinking even infants. So if you pick an infant up and hold them to your chest and they're crying, start breathing mm -hmm. um, and start low, s making your breath slower and deeper. Mm -hmm. And the child will start responding to mm -hmm. the fact that you are relaxing and they will feel that and they will start mirroring your breath. Mm -hmm. that they're holding, you're holding them up to your body. So even infants, we can help them learn to self-regulate and how to down-regulate by just holding them and gradually calming even ourselves further. Mm -hmm. And young children, when they're, you've had a toddler who's out of control, and sometimes they just need to be held until they can uh, stop flailing about and continually accelerating themselves, right? So by, you know, we, we teach our young ones that, but we can do it with, with adults too, just by being present. If we're calm in the face of someone who's not calm, um, we help them kind of become more down-regulate and regulate their own mm. emotionality down. So very mm. important. You know, and you can do that with your spouse or your friends. Yes. Um, it can be very helpful. Yeah, because if with your spouse or friends, let's say with your spouse, if you're upset, then your husband... Um, if he becomes upset, it tends to escalate rather than deregulate. I mean, uh, deescalate, de excuse yes. me, sorry, not deregulate, but deescalate mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. And so it can be very helpful because we have these mirroring neurons where we tend to mirror back what we're saying, which is so, so important. Uh, mm -hmm. Wonderful. These are great, great illustrations. Very, very helpful. Uh, this next question from our audience here tonight is one of my greatest fears is that one of my children will die. It happens to parents every day, this person suggests. Um, it, it drives my kids crazy. Any advice? This was the question that was being asked. So one of my greatest fears is that one of my children will die. That's a very broad question because there's a lot of pieces to that. How would you first respond to that, Dr. Burt? One of my greatest fears is that one of my children will die. Any advice? Well, of course. If we think about someone that we love would die, that would be distressing, right? Mm -hmm. It would be terrible. Yes. It would be a horrible thing. Mm. Um, and so the, the part, though, that what the fear that someone will die is um, kind of imagining that. Um, it does happen, a lot of things happen, right? It, mm -hmm. But if you imagined every possible negative thing that would happen, really only one of those things is probably gonna happen, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's, there's millions of things that could happen. If we think about them, it would be really, and imagine them, our body starts reacting mm -hmm. to what we think about. It's, it's just amazing. Um, they've actually done, a, they did a study, one of the studies that just struck me so profoundly is uh, they did a study where they had um, some high school, I mean, high school or college, I college students playing basketball, and they divided this into two groups. One that practiced free throws. These were basketball players, so they practiced free throws. And so they knew what it was supposed to feel like to do a good three free throw, you know, how their body should respond and how it should look and how it should feel in the air, you know, when he's letting go and the whole thing. And so they would say, practice that. And then they had another group that, that they knew how their body was supposed to react and they knew how the three throw was supposed to be, but they just said, instead of practicing, we want you to just to practice in your imagination. And they, I don't remember how long the practice was, but... Um, they found that those who practiced perfectly in their imagination did better than those who practiced in reality. Um, that's because they, you know, this is the case because they really knew what it felt like. Um, Senator John McCain, who was a prisoner of war in 
North Vietnam, had practiced golf when he was a prisoner of war. And when he got out, he, he still had his golf game. So he practiced it, obviously, in his imagination, in his cell in Vietnam. So um, our minds are, they, I use those examples because it's a, something physical, but it can also be physical when we practice things in our mind. We imagine things vividly. Our bodies respond to them. So, um, so thinking, getting back to the question, you know, thinking about um, and imagining our children dying, um, our body is going to react negatively to that. So it's time to change that imagery. Um, you go back to our, our things, uh, our steps here. Um, is there something that you can't, as, as problem solving, you know, we are training our children. Is there something that you can do to help protect your children so they make wise decisions and not be at risk of being hurt? And, you, and if there is, you do that. And then at that point, now we're going to turn it over to the Lord because, right, that we've done all we can do. And now um, thinking about it doesn't help our children, it doesn't help us, and it doesn't prevent things from happening. So it's, it's time to change that channel, that remote control in the brain, to another image. So to change that to remote control channel, because uh, you, you mentioned that earlier, it's a great, great v visual imagery of that, is that sometimes a person can worry and, and not be aware of where that worry comes from. And then as they begin to reflect, your very last concept, mm -hmm. that when they begin to reflect, they may begin to realize, oh, I, I was modeled. I, I saw that modeled in my home, or I saw that modeled with my aunt or my uncle. And I took on that worry wart position early on in life. And so I just automatically, autonomically, back to your concept, I just become a little bit reactionary. You used the word imagery. There's a wonderful book, Mind Over Mood, on page about 243, I believe. It talks about the four, four parts of what you were talking, mindfulness, which you mentioned, and that is good breathing, the second one that they mention, uh, Podesky in her book. She's one of the authors, the psychologist. And then the, the third is relaxing, relaxing your muscles. And then the fourth is the imagery that, of which you're speaking. And so imagery, as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Burt, if someone were thinking of sitting by a very calm pond, I think you were saying like a lake or a body of water, and you were thinking how calm it was, that your body will begin to calm down, much like you were saying the basketball players, as they would imagine and take in the sights of being successful, that their body is responding correspondingly. It's, it's almost right. reacting in the same way that thoughts are. That's why I think the Scripture is so clear about, you know, be anxious for nothing, but in everything in prayer and supplication, that's a way to be mindful of the presence mm -hmm. of God and that you will guard, He will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So the heart is, of course, the somatic, the body, and then you have the mind, and, of course, we have a soul as well. But mm -hmm. you were going to add to that. But oh, yeah, I was just <laughs> I was thinking of, a, of another Scripture, yes. which is... Um, you know, where the heart is, you know, mm. there you will be also, you know, yes. so what you're thinking about, what you're focusing yes. on, what you're, what you value. Uh, yes, because when the heart is palpitating, like you had mentioned earlier, it was something I hadn't quite thought about the way you said it was so unique, is that um, when we change our body, we relax, cool down, breathe slowly and deeply, and move from the autonomic to the parasympathetic, um, kind of the freeze frame that when we begin to slow down, we then begin to feel like I'm not going to die because most people who have high heart palpita palpitations like somebody who has a panic attack, um, that's not a panic disorder I'm saying because that would be where it's fairly constant for the person. It happens again and again and again. It's repeated. But someone who has just a panic attack, the heart is very, it's very scary when your heart is racing and you're not quite sure why. And sometimes helping the person to do the imagery can be real helpful because it distracts from, I'm now getting really worked up because I'm focused on my heart palpitations. Mm -hmm. Have you found that helpful in your, 
your work. Yeah, it's just um, what I like love about the imagery is that it, our bodies react to it without us having to think. I need to slow my heart down. You know, I mean, I, I don't know right. how to do that. I guess some yogis do, but <laughs> I can't like say, okay, just slow down. Right. I, I have to do something else. Yes. And the, yes. Both Dr. Bird and I are trained in EMDR, and what we call it's called a calm place where you think about that calm place and then you invite the, the brain to correspond with that. But it can be very helpful. It's, it's not telling your body to do something. It's actually experiencing is right. what you're saying. Right. Yeah. So this, this next question is, thank you so much, how do you take away the stress and worrying for problems that are actually happening? So let's go right to the present. Say we're trying to be in the present. However, mm -hmm. when we are in the present, mm -hmm. it is happening. And, but, but you either can do nothing or you do not know what to do is the question, I think. So yeah. how do you take away the stress and worrying for problems that are actually happening in the present, but you either can do nothing or do not know what to do? Well, I think we, we want to just remember that the stress and the worry are separate from the problem and the problem solving. So what I mean by that is we tend to think of it's all together. You know, mm -hmm. I, if, uh, if something is bothering me, something is stressful, um, some outside thing that's happening, um, um, my boss tells me I'm not doing a good job at work. And I feel distressed about that. And uh, somebody said, well, why are you upset? And it's like, because my boss just told me that I'm not doing a good job. And it's like, but that's not really why, you know, that we're upset. Um, when, when the boss tells us that we're not doing a good job, if we believe I'm not okay, or I really am not doing a good job, or I'm going to get fired, or we have some negative thought that goes with it, then we might get upset. Or, but if we were to think to ourselves, you know, my boss doesn't even know what I'm doing. I, I know that I'm doing a good job, mm -hmm. and uh, she's been out of the country for the last two weeks, and if I get a chance to tell her, you know, maybe she'll understand, or maybe she won't, but I know I'm doing a good job. I might just be irritated with her for making a comment like that, or I might feel nothing. I might feel fine, like I'm not really worried. So it's not what the boss says or what's happening that makes us upset. It's what we think and believe about it that makes us upset. Um, so if there really is a problem, um, on one hand, it's like, is there something we can do? I'm in that way saying, well, well, they either there's nothing you can do or you don't know what to do. So well, those are two different things. So if there's nothing you can do, then um, if there's nothing you can do, then you're really not responsible for doing anything, right? Hmm. It, it's this is this is kind of in the changing of your mind, and now it's like, okay, so I need to let go of that upset because. It, that alarm is not serving me. It's not doing what God designed it to do, which was to point me to a problem to solve. So once it's pointed you to the problem, if you either can solve it or you can't solve it, then it's time to turn off the alarm. Now, I know that's hard to do. I know all of this stuff, and sometimes it's hard for me to turn off the alarm. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I understand that, but we want to separate the upset from the actual problem solving as much as we can and try to just identify that as, as separate. So sometimes, um, I will bring up one thing, getting back to using, you know, engaging with others, uh, as in, in that final reflection, whether it's God or others, is that um, you may find if you get upset um, and you go talk to somebody, um, and Maybe it's one time or you talk several times, but the time you've talked it out two or three times, you know, it doesn't bother you quite as much as the first time. Um, there is something about that that it is built into us that we're able to process out, out the upset, um, especially if we're able to kind of think it through and talk it through. 
Um, so that can be really helpful, whether it's a, somebody you know or, or even in counseling, but oftentimes it's just a family member or a friend where you can say, you know, this really upset me. It was perspective taking um, and, and that type of thing. So um, sometimes there isn't anything we can do. Um, I know, um, you know, it was some family health challenges in my family, and I can't do anything to change the actual challenges of those that, you know, that my mother is experiencing right now in terms of the physical. Um, so what can I do? So you want to focus on what can you do mm -hmm. and then turn the rest over to God. Yeah. Those are very, very good w words. And uh, most all of us have faced something uh, like that. And uh, well, we sure th thank you, Dr. Burt, for being with us. And uh, would you join me in thanking Dr. Burt for joining us this evening for My Therapist Says. I want to thank you very much. Beautifully done. So helpful. Uh, these are very good ideas and proven tactics, if you will, tools that you could use in working on uh, your anxiety or the, the worrisome part of you. Uh, each of us has that, as you said. Sometimes it can be very helpful to keep us safe, that sort of thing. I would like to invite you to consider our next My Therapist Says. We do have Dr. David Levy, medical doctor, neurosurgeon. He has been with us before. Uh, and it's been quite popular. He's going to be back with us in January. Listen to this topic, and I know you can see it up on the screen. Do you have a voice in your relationship? He's going to help us to work on having that voice, which will likely decrease anxiety and increase our uh, self-efficacy, which means that we would have a voice and, and a say in relationships. So I hope that you'll invite your friends, those who would even like to listen live stream-wise. They're welcome to do so. And that is in January. Can you believe it? It'll be 2018. So again, I want to thank you for being here this evening and joining us and those who are live streaming as well. We're so glad that you are with us this evening and those who will be listening to these, uh, this DVD at a later time that will be archived and available. May we have a word of prayer in honor of God and His presence here this evening as He goes with us and as He's been with us here this evening. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege of uh, pulling together uh, the coalescing, if you will, of science, which comes from you, uh, science and biblical truth. So anything that's discovered, we know that the Bible has so much to say about that. And we thank you, Father, for the combining of these two very important parts of our life. And we thank you for each person here that's been listening or will be listening to this later. We pray that your Holy Spirit would bless each and every one, that you would speak individually and carefully as you are the only one can do that and to help each of us as we progress in enriching our relationships. So we thank you. We bless you this evening, Father, and thank you for blessing us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Again, thank you for coming and being with us at My Therapist Says. Have a blessed evening.